Beautiful. Well, hello, everyone. It's wonderful to see you. We've got, as I say, 34 participants sitting here. And there's so many lovely faces and names sitting in this Zoom chat. Uh, for me, I my name is Hayden. I'm from Brisbane, Australia. It is uh, just after midnight here. So I am I apologize for my disheveled looking state. Uh, I hope all of you are far more awake than I am, but I'm here for Ismay for the student chapter. Uh, this workshop here is going to be a, a beautiful presentation by Dr. Ruth de Uh Ruth, I'm sure you've, or uh, well, I'm sure everyone here has had a quick read up of Ruth. We've had some brief little bios and our various social media and email blasts. But Ruth is a uh, a wonderful research, or a wonderful, uh, goodness, a researcher is not enough to summarize what it is she does. She's not only uh, a a, uh, a wonderfully competent musician, a professional working musician of, of her time. She's an educator as well, has worked extensively throughout classroom and instrumental teaching. Uh, in addition to being a, a, an esteemed researcher at a Boston University and, of course, Boston, United States. So if anyone's from that area, you've got some representation today. And our own Ismay Shri, uh, I believe, studied under Ruth for some time. So these are, we've, we've, it's a very small world, this music education world. I often remind people in this field that there are, at least in Australia, there are often uh, as many, as many say, chemistry researchers in the city you're in as there are music education researchers on the planet. So it's a, a very small, very spread out world. So uh, Ruth herself, she's uh, in uh, well, oh, pardon me, I'm very, very tired. Uh, she is uh, above being a uh, but being a tremendous researcher and all of these things, Ruth here is going to talk to us today about her journey into her current position, which is, of course, uh, quite an esteemed one. Um, and what I hope Ruth is going to be able to uh, disseminate to us today is how she became who she, who she is and not just what she is. And I'm confident that you are going to love what she's going to talk about. Uh, I won't I won't let my, my, my tired state interrupt her any longer. Uh, and I would love Ruth to tell us in her words, perhaps, uh, who she is, what she is, how she does it, and most importantly, how she got there, uh, because it'd be wonderful, even if for me, to learn how, what, who, etc. So I will, uh, I'll formally kick off. Welcome to this uh, Ismay Student Chapter webinar with Dr. Ruth Dubrow from Boston University. Thank you so much, Hayden. That was that was a wonderful, uh, beautiful introduction. Um, I'm delighted to be here. I'm going to share my screen shortly, which means I probably won't be able to see you. Which so I'm going to encourage you to interrupt me at any time, so that I can clarify anything that needs clarification, or if you would like to comment. I am not offended by this. I taught middle school for many years, and I'm quite used to being interrupted while I'm speaking. So I'm going to share the screen, and I'm, okay, and so here we go. This PowerPoint is going to guide my speaking so I don't get um, off on a tangent. I'm, I was asked to talk about how I became a researcher. And this was, I have never done this before, and it was, it caused me to reflect on the many experiences that I've had during my life that got me to this place that I am today. And so as I began to think about myself and how I fit into as a performer and a scholar and a teacher, I decided that really it was the social, socio-cultural experiences that I had during my life and how my engagement with music in particular, which manifested very early on, influenced my development as both a teacher and a scholar. So that is really the premise of my presentation. Um, as we know, everything that we do in our life influences how we perceive music, our preferences for even food, and what we consider meaningful in what we do. So I'm going to, okay, good. So 
it's my musical background started very, very young. My first memories are about music. And if any of you have children or are still in touch with your inner child, and I hope you are, um, we engaged in musical free play as kids and we improvised and we explored and we were curious my sister and i sang together a lot during our play and we were encouraged to do so i i have a um, father who is very musical so we often sang songs and performed in our living room just as a family so that was one of the ways we started in as a child. Um, and then through the musical engagement that we did, I think that I developed a sense of who I was. Music really helped me understand the world in a way that I might not if I hadn't been singing and playing. And so it also helped me develop a good imagination. And Imagination is really important in the classroom when engaging with students, but it's also important, imagination and curiosity are very important for scholarship because it's good to see the world as it is, but then when we're doing research, we often need to think about how things might be. And the most important thing was I became open to new ideas and new people. So positionality is super important when doing scholarly work. And so I wanted to talk about what it is and then how it influenced my own development. So as you can see, your positionality is part of your identity and how you perceive yourself in terms of your gender, your sexuality. From my perspective, being born in the US and the daughter of college professors, education was highly valued you could almost do anything but you better do well in school that was what we we were told as children and my family didn't do a lot of traveling to see things we experienced a lot of things in nature we did camping we spent time in the woods so this led me to think about the interdependence among humans, animals, and other living beings. So I developed a, a sort of an environmental awareness, even as a child. And then being of the Unitarian faith, um, I focused more on questioning rather than answers in with regard to human spirituality. And so my social context, as you will see later, I'm going to tie this all together, had a very has had a very big influence on my scholarship. I grew up during the civil rights movement. I grew up during hippies and the counterculture. There was the rise of popular music and popular culture. Um, I believe Bowling Green University was the first university that had a popular culture studies department. Um, there were technological developments. TV was still black and white, but that was something that brought the world into our homes in a way that hadn't been done previously. And of course, then musical entertainment changed a great deal. And as I was making this PowerPoint, I noticed how this visual that I have about decent housing and decent pay and decent jobs are still themes that we face in the world today. So things have changed, but things have stayed the same in many ways. Growing up near college campuses, I was really influenced by hippies 
I mean, that seems like a very antiquated thing now. But um, Woodstock was a major event in my childhood. And at that point, hippies were very interested in Eastern spirituality and politics centered on peace and love. And those are things that I can still get behind and they do influence the, my research interests and some of the frameworks that I have used in my work. Okay, so the picture that you are seeing is my father at the piano with his family. They were in Life magazine sometime in the 19, late 1940s. His, he grew up with family music making, as did I. Family music making was an everyday event. And we sang a lot of different songs. My father played piano, ukulele. We did a lot of creative, improvisatory singing in the car, in the living room. And that has influenced my music learning a great deal. Um, and I've learned to play the guitar. I taught myself. I got a guitar from my father and I figured it out. And now as a scholar, I'm realizing that I engaged like my family in informal learning processes. So I'm always very interested in uh, how in music acquisition and the different ways that people are exposed to learning and what perhaps pedagogical practices may be appropriate in different happened. father took a position at the university. And at that time, I experienced culture shock. Even though I was still in the US, as Hayden said in his intro, the US is a very large place. And so different parts of the United States have different cultures, and they are radically different. The point here is that I experienced what it was like to be the one who was different during high school i had a different accent i had a different religion i had different values about what was important i didn't value you know my appearance as much as many of my peers in the high school but what i learned from the experience it was very important and something that I carry with me as, as an adult is that I'm very aware of cultural differences, but I have learned from the experience that I had how important it is to accept people for who they are and not to impose my own cultural biases on others when I meet them in my um, scholarly work and in my daily life. So as I made my way through high school being very different, I used music as a catalyst for a sense of belonging. And we know from many of the things that have happened post COVID that music does foster a sense of belonging. It worked for me. I've known that for quite some time. I sang in the high school choir, but I didn't really enjoy the music. The music was chosen by the conductor. The songs were slow and religious, and so they didn't resonate with me. So I joined the pop trio, and I ended up having a leadership role. I had an autonomy. I did a lot of the work, but it gave me a sense of purpose and belonging. And then finally in high school, I, at age 15, I became the lead singer in a band with two brothers who played in country music venues in the area. But it was my first taste of being a professional musician and I liked it. So I continued along that path. 
And then I made it to college. As you know, I was an informal learner. So college was a bit of a shock. We didn't have lessons growing up. I was a 16 year old kid. I graduated early from high school and started college. And so when I became a music major, I was rather surprised that I would be studying classical music. For some reason, no one bothered to tell me that. And as you can see from this picture, my perceptions were of the female pop singers you see below of the time. There's Olivia Newton-John, Streisand, and Diana Ross. But I was expected to sing in the style, uh, classical style, which of course I didn't speak the language, so there was an immediate barrier. And I did read music, but not well. And so for the first time, I struggled with music learning. And so I was successful in college. I had bands. I loved music. And I decided to move to Jackson, Mississippi, which is an urban area of Mississippi. And I was able to get work as, as a recording artist. And my first recording was with this person, Jeter Davis, who I never met. But I will recall my first experience in the studio and the first experience hearing my own voice played back to me so I could hear what I sounded like. And that was a revelation because this was, I had to reflect on what I was sounding like, what my accent sounded like. Um, and so this was, this was a really good informal learning experience again. And the people I worked with educated me. So I got more work singing jingles and demos and um, doing background vocals. But again, it was informal and oral music learning that served me better than the, what I learned in the academy. And this applied to becoming a jazz singer. I got offered a job singing in a jazz band. So I taught myself how to improvise. I learned how to scat sing. I listened to vinyl records. And um, so I got some Ella Fitzgerald records and Al Jarreau. And I'd practice along with the records doing vocal improvisation. And then I also um, practiced by myself. I'd just take a walk and practice vocal improvisation. And again, in where my, my environment, the socio-cultural surroundings that I operated in were focused on participatory music making. Um, so I worked at Malico Studios and I worked alongside a lot of very good musicians from the gospel, country, R&B and soul genres. Um, I was hired to do background vocals. I was hired to do demos. It was, was for people of different abilities, different interests, and in particular, uh, cultural and racial barriers that were very prevalent in the South. And I was always invited to participate and they corrected me very gently. And it was a very human centered participatory approach, which I continue to value in both my teaching and in my scholarship, I became very interested in how does this manifest in grown up adult music making and grown up or, or lifelong learning in particular. And it was at that time when I decided that I needed to foster a style of my own predicated on authentic human expression. And I, and I think that is versus 
technical ability, whereas in the academy, we tend to focus very on technical abilities rather than what brings us to music in the first place, which is human expression and the need to express ourselves through music. And so I reached a plateau and I decided to move to New York. And again, it was a different kind of culture shock to be in New York was hard work, but I met people from all over the world, which was exhilarating. And I got gigs, uh, the things that I had learned in Jackson, my oral skills um, made me fairly marketable. And so I developed entrepreneurial skills and found work doing piano bars and cabarets and restaurants and recording. Um, my family was horrified that I would move to New York, but I ended up making a living and being successful. But of course, there was this other part of me that needed to go back to school. I wanted to become an educator. I'm not sure when that came into my mind, but I wanted to be able to teach so that I could do music for my entire life. And that was important because I thought, well, if I'm too old to do music, I can teach music and that will keep me vital and involved. And so I was very fortunate to work with an educator who was compassionate, who didn't try to make me into um, his protege, but rather honored my own musical interests and provided me with an musical understandings that could be applied to different types of music because I was making a living as a pop musician. And lo and behold, I was hired as a, an adjunct voice professor. So City College had a pop vocal music program, which was very far before its time. And I was hired to do that. And uh, I was also on the voice faculty. And I was very, very happy there. Um, New York City is an amazing place with many wonderful people. But then I ended up, my, my husband got a scholarship to Harvard and we moved to Boston, which I, it was very uprooting again. And I found myself starting over one more time. The performing gigs that I had were not really uh, a wage that would sustain both of us. So I took a pu full time public school teaching job and I thought I would be an elementary teacher and I ended up in a middle school and I loved it. I know that that's probably very frightening for many of you, but Adolescents are an amazing age group. They are very, very astute. And if you can relate to them on their own terms, then you will be a successful middle school educator. But one of the things that I learned was that I needed to facilitate rather than teach. It was a humbling experience. But it taught me a lot about teaching and the purposes of teaching and how I might facilitate the betterment of myself and others through music. And so I was very happy at that job for quite a long time. I want I being a lifelong learner, as I now know I am, I wanted to know everything about teaching and learning. And while I was teaching, I took classes. I think I've been in school just about every year of my life. And then my entrepreneurial skills leadership positions in the ORF level of MMEA 
um, not ISME at that point because I was very focused on, on music education in the United States. But it was at this time that I started to write articles and to get published. So I didn't wait until I started my doctoral program to do so. And I didn't wait till my doctoral program to, to engage in classes that would inform my teaching and my pedagogical practices, but also as a scholar, I always wanted to learn. During that time, I was able to conduct select ensembles, but more importantly, and this is it, this has become more important to me recently, as particularly at the university level, I loved my students. And that was very fundamental for my success as a teacher. And I'll talk about that theoretical construct subs in a bit later so you'll understand that and then came the doctoral studies it was really a logical step and in my own self-actualization which if you know about maslow you understand that having a sense of purpose and self-actualization are part of uh well-being and um growth over a lifetime so when I decided to get my DMA, I was really excited and I felt a sense of accomplishment just being accepted into the program. I was challenged again. I, I, need, I need to be challenged. I know that. I, I enjoy the rigors of academia and I enjoyed being a, a group of select learners, being part of the DMA program at Boston University. So I'm going to talk a little bit about my dissertation because my dissertation, and I don't know how many of you are in this dissertation phase, but it, tie, uh, it tied into my teaching. So my research was relevant to the things that I knew and it added to my schema about teaching and learning. And again, Sociocultural theories, social constructionism was my theoretical lens. And it seemed to me to be an obvious theoretical framework for understanding my own classroom. And then I engaged in critical participatory action research. I did it with my students. I conducted action research with 11 year olds. Yes, I was very afraid that it wasn't going to work on many occasions, but I did it in this with the sixth graders who had no preconceived idea about what middle school choir was supposed to be. And then I used the theoretical perspective of critical inquiry to examine the practices that we were engaging in. I had been trained as a choral educator, like most everyone else of my generation, that the choir director was responsible for everything, choosing the repertoire, selecting the dress that everyone would wear, making the concert dates, doing the concert order. And I began to question those practices, especially when they started to be un proving unsuccessful with middle schoolers. So my study was to put learning in the hands of the students. It was an experiment, by the way. Um, the students, I put the students in charge of their own learning. And then I observed and we reflected and we discussed as things, as practices emerged during the research period. And the students were amazingly wonderful researchers and very critical thinkers. And they taught me many, many things about choral learning, their learning preferences, and the things that they valued. So through my dissertation, Again, it was another humbling experience. 
I learned that I needed to facilitate. They didn't really need me to make all the decisions. They were quite capable of doing things on their own and they preferred working in friendship groups and they preferred working on music of their own choosing. In other words, they preferred informal learning practices, constructivist practices, and that was illuminating and it really informed um, how some changes in my pedagogical procedures in the classroom and my own pedagogy in that I believe that education is a discussion and that I am not the master and that I don't know everything and what I do know may not may or may not be effective for every student that I have in my classes. So those were some things I learned and then sure enough two years after I graduated I got offered a position at Boston University and I was very ambivalent about leaving my teaching position because I did love my students and I felt that I had a very important job in music education. And then again, I was starting over one more time. And so I joined the faculty and those of you who are in higher ed know that there is not a whole lot of structure in the university environment. So I had to learn how to structure my, my time and to find work time for work on scholarship and balance that with teaching and presenting and all of those things. So again, I had to put my problem solving skills to work to make myself successful. This is going to be the start of my seventh year. And I feel like I'm finally in the groove, um, but maybe that's my own perception. I feel like I have a grip on that. So the whole point of this this discussion this morning or my discussion is to talk about this positionality and how it informs my scholarly work and some of the theoretical constructs that I tend to gravitate toward. And the reason I'm doing this is because you are all, as scholars, going to need to find theoretical constructs or th learning theories or things that resonate with you. And you have your own positionality. So these are things that worked for me and I'm going to discuss them in more detail. But performing consistently informs my role as a teacher, scholar, and student because I still think I'm a student. I'm still learning. My students are still teaching me things. Remember, I'm a critical pedagogue. And I view music making as a, a human activity rather than something that needs to be conquered and rather than something that is predicated on excellence again that's my positionality i think that music brings joy self-discovery and that is the most important thing and again that informs my position and how i view um, my teaching as well and I'm very interested in the relational aspects of teaching and learning and how this informs the dynamic in the classroom. Um, I've been told by a lot of my students in the academy that they are sometimes afraid of their professors. And that makes me very sad because I, we know that if children are fearful, that this interferes with learning. And some of our best teachers are the ones that we had good relationships with. So I'm that that informs my research interests quite a bit. I'm always interested in possibilities of what might be. I'm an optimistic person and 
I think that one of the things that we do research for is to look for ways to improve our practices and to discover new possibilities for music education. And I think that's a pretty noble thing. And then, of course, issues of social justice, belongingness, gender, and cultural competence. We are in a post-human world. I'm not going to get into that, but we, we are in a different industrial revolution, and we are facing some ecological problems. There are social justice issues are in our face every day. And I'm interested in, in possibilities for what might be and how we can improve um, music teaching and learning in ways that include those considerations and make classrooms a better place for all of our students. So here's a framework that I have used and, and I drew from positive psychology and in particular eudaimonia, which is well-being and how music can facilitate well-being. I did a study of some older musicians using this framework. And if you are a younger scholar, don't hesitate to contact people I, I contacted Carol Reif at the University of Wisconsin-Madison, and she gave me permission to use her, um, this diagram for my work and as a construct in my own um, research. She was very, very generous. So if you don't be intimidated, please contact others in the field that you, who might share the same interests and meet with them and find out what they have to say and what they might be able to share because um, that was very helpful to me to have this to be able to use this diagram. I'm very interested in compassionate music teaching. Um, Karen Hendricks is on the faculty at Boston University and she talks about compassion. And again, the relational aspects of music are very, very important to me and they have made an impact on my teaching and other people's teaching. So this has been a very valuable resource for me. If you are looking at these types of things, you might consult this, um, this text. More recently, um, my colleague Kin Vu and I have begun to analyze, do a longitudinal study of the undergraduate music education program at Boston University using a pedagogy of love as a framework. And again, this is, goes to the relational aspects of teaching and learning and and the idea of care and commitment to students, that students shouldn't be just left on their own. And it relates to a, the work of Freire in particular, in my mind, and critical education. And meeting students where they are, nurturing them, and not just teaching them information, but teaching them to think, be able when they finish Re recently i acknowledge gender roles in the academy and the myth that women are treated equally in the music education profession. So I was very fascinated with the work of Judith Butler and who views gender not as something that we are, but something that we do. And so, and, and how we perform gender in our lives. And we all do that in a very unique, an individualized way and i think that it's very it relates to a lot of the things that are happening in the world and i do believe things are changing so um 
I used Butler's construct of gender performity. And I was told by one of my colleagues that I had to have some music in my presentation. So this is me. I, I did, I wrote a chapter, it's coming out, it's called Doll Parts. And I drew from punk music. And here is me enacting um, the role of a performer. And you can see that it's, it's, it's a stylized thing, but this is how we enact gender. Here it is. So that was me making a point about this is what I really look like, but uh, you can make yourself appear or disappear according to how you present yourself to others. So that was my point about um, doll parts and how we all do this to a certain extent in our lives. And certainly performers do that every day. Uh, you know that Lady Gaga puts on her pajamas at night and her slippers and goes to bed just like everyone else. So how we present ourselves to others is very fundamental in our own self-perception and other people's perception of us. And then, of course, there is music and belongingness. I don't think I really need to discuss that too much, but it's the relationships that we have through music that are very important in life. And finally, this is my latest thing, is critical performance theory, because my, my role as a performer has made me realize that my role in the classroom is equally as important. But here's the critical performance theory makes the class, it fits in with what I've learned in that the, the classroom is not just the performance of the teacher. It needs to be transformative for both the learner and the teacher, and it should be relational. And I'm not performing to get something from students. I'm performing with them to engender new understandings. And this has worked for me in the uh, pop vocal pedagogy private studio. I've been working with a student who has a physical disability. And we've been working on um, finding accommodations and modifications that will allow him to be a performer despite some of the physical constraints that he faces. So that is something that is in progress right now that I'm still learning about because remember I'm still a student. So one of my goals today is to get you to think about your own identity um, and I'm hoping that you have a paper or you will think or you, you will be able to share 
some of the things that are influencing, oops, sorry, I meant ahead. Think about your own identity, your own positionality, your how growing up has influenced your ideas and research interests. And so I'm, can you maybe respond in the chat? Since I can't see you, but I would like to hear from you, um, perhaps you could discuss your um how some how your identity influences your research interests maybe just put your interests in there CPROM is the Commission for the Education of the Professional Musician. It's one of the uh, one of the commissions that Ismay runs. Uh, we've got a number of really esteemed researchers in there. Uh, Dawn Bennett is involved uh, fairly heavily. We've also got uh, Julie Ballantyne. Quite a lot of Australians in CPROM, but uh, people from all over the place pop uh, find their way in. Um, Guadalupe Lopez Inugues, who I believe is in uh, Finland right now, but she's from Spain herself. Um, yeah, CPROM is a really exciting part of Ismay. I'm very, very proud to be part of it. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. Um, I don't think we have as much, I don't think performing informs um, scholarship in the same way in the United States yet. I would like to see it move in that direction. Um, yes, good, music ed history, music creative practice, beautiful, yes. All right. It remember that performing doesn't have to be on the professional stage. That I think is also another misconception. You don't have to be a professional performer. You can perform in front of your family. That you know, I think those are that is another very limiting context. Yes, you're singing a lot informs how you function as a scholar. Great. Okay, so thinking about your training as a musician and your life experiences and the groups that you, the, the age group or the cultural group, how does that inform your approach to inquiry? I know that my, my age and my experiences contribute a lot to my perspective. So can you think of how does your positionality influence your approach to inquiry? How do, what are the questions you want to ask? You know, what do you think are important issues that we might be might be able to change? A lecture, that's right, instrumental music education and motivation. That is a that is a very important topic. Thank you, Jody. Yes. We are all researchers, even if we are practitioners, just saying most of you do action research every day in your classrooms. You just don't call it that. Anytime you try a new pedagogical practice or something that you've learned, you're doing a bit of action research. And yes, marginalized people and access. Access is still a huge um, uh, issue in music education. And I don't see it changing. Ah, Indigenous Australians. Yes, that would be great. Yes, our positionality changes as we grow. And my perspective um has changed over time new topics yes i i found that music and disability 
I mean, music participation and disability is a very under-researched area. Yes, we know about working with children with special needs, but not adults who want to be in the academy and become performers. Beautiful. Insider, outsider perspectives, absolutely. Um, it's good to have both. The power of music on literacy. Dr. Khan, when you, I, I think your camera's on. Can you talk about what your definition of literacy? Can you hear me? Is Dr. Khan there? I'd like to hear more because my idea of music literacy is the ability to use Note, reading Western notation. I would be curious to know more about that. But if you're not comfortable talking, that's fine. Um, I lo I, that's lovely that you're going to look at informal community music practices. This is something that is not unusual, I think, in academia. Um, even at Boston University, where the music education program is quite progressive, our uh, music performance program is still a conservatory style program, and we don't have popular music education in the performance program. That's probably going to shock many of you who are in Europe, but that's the way American universities continue to be structured. It's been a very slow growth process. So one of the things that I became interested in was music learning theories and how they Im inform pedagogical strategies. Like I said, I am, I, I, sociocultural theories have proven to be va valuable in my own classrooms. And then, of course, critical pedagogy in which I'm learning with students in the classroom has also been very valuable. However, I will tell you that no one pedagogical strategy is universally successful. So maybe you could put what is your preferred method of music acquisition and how does it inform your teaching? This is a topic that is always a hot button topic in my classes because my student undergrad students believe in reading music and then I we always go back and forth about the importance of reading western notation which I do and I I do it fairly well but it's not my preferred method nor is it something that I use every day. Hands-on, yes, experiential learning, beautiful. Um, invented notation, right, active music making. You'd be surprised how many pre-service teachers don't understand that small children can learn without, without looking at a piece of music. Shri, I think you know that. I've, I've seen some of your work. So I, I can speak positively on that. Um, but you would be very surprised how many of our undergraduate students think that music education begins with... Okay, sorry about that. Um, that children can learn only by notation. I, it just amazes me that they think that. 
Okay, I'm going to move forward here because I see that we are running out of time. So, um, again, presentational music versus participatory music. If you teach elementary, you're very participatory. Yay. But as children grow older, that starts to end. And that's very sad because children now feel inadequate in some ways. Okay, and I'm going to move along here. I just want you to think about the questions. This is my last point in scholarship. The questions that you ask are often more important than the answers. And I know that's difficult. Many people who are engaged in scholarship don't see that. Everyone, everyone wants answers. But the questions and how they're worded and what they are about are so very, very important. And that's what keeps scholarship moving forward. So I hope that you will take that to heart. And I also want to encourage everyone, regardless of what your positionality is, to take action. Don't be afraid to talk to people that you know, to get yourself out there so you can get the information you need and to set your goals high because you know they just might happen i didn't think i'd be speaking to you today eight years ago i could not imagine myself being with you all today and here i am how lucky am i how privileged am i to be here with you so I want to thank you all. If you have any questions, I'm happy to stay on and, and speak with you. I'm going to stop sharing so I can see faces. If anyone has anything to offer, I am willing to stay. Thank you I so much for your time, Ruth. Look, I, I'll, I'll, I'm happy to chair a bit of a question session and whoever's happy to stay is welcome to stay i'll i'll be here until the questions run out i'm very happy to um there have been a number of questions throughout the uh popped into the chat throughout the time we've been sitting here so i'd like to pop some of them into your into your brain if i can to try pick your uh, pick your thoughts here ruth if i can thank you Wonderful. So I'll start. I'll start chronologically. One of the earlier questions uh, was from Joyce, and uh, Joyce was intrigued by the experience in music education and how that what your experience of teaching music uh, has been in your curriculum, and what you believe the best approach in general is to teaching music. Um, whether or not Joyce ref was referring specifically to uh, the the earlier experiences in your classroom teaching or the higher education, I'll let you um, I'll let you answer that. But what do you believe are one of the some of the better approaches to teaching music in general, which I believe you've covered a bit of, so uh, might require some re-emphasizing. Perfect. Um, being a constructivist or constructionist, I believe that learning is experiential. So I design learning experiences for either children or young adults so that they can, and, and by having either engagement with music or engaging in teaching themselves, that is the vehicle for learning. And, and I, you can't learn to play a piano by reading a book. You can teach teach a young person to become a teacher. They need to teach. They need to have that experience. They also need to be able to teach or do music without fear of making mistakes because that is how we learn. And people pay lip service to that, but they don't often bring it to fruition in the classroom. So, and sometimes my students will get mad. Well, you need to tell me what to do. And I'm like, well, I can only tell you what to do to a certain extent, but then 
you need to develop thinking processes that will allow it to, you to do that yourself. And learning is when they don't need you anymore. Mm -hmm. They are independent, then you have done your job. It's an interesting role of a teacher, isn't it? That success is when you have uh, taught yourself out of your position. It's a funny role, isn't it? There aren't many jobs where success is no longer being needed. But we don't, we don't always get to that point. And they still call me and say, hey, Dr. DeBro, I need help with that. It, but, but the idea is they, or maybe it's just learning to learn, learning how to learn what they need hmm. too. There, there is that part of it. But it is a, it's a wonderful job. Of course. <laughs> now, there was another question from Kan Lu who said, who first of all, said it was wonderful to hear your story. And the question that they asked was how, it's a, a very general one, so no doubt it's going to be a, quite a personal answer, uh, was how do you balance teaching and scholarship within, I met your, within the university, which I imagine refers to your role in the university? How do you balance those two arms of what it is you do? Well, teaching in a university, fortunately, is not usually a five day week like teaching in a public school is so there are classes that you mean but the hardest thing is to find the time to write and so the people the people that I work with and I have learned that I'm a better writer in the morning so my daily schedule will allows for that wonderful coffee and computer time in the morning before I go off and do my daily work so that I have my my best thinking. Some people work better at night, but the critical thing is to make the time to do the scholarly work and to make meetings with people you need to meet with and and to and not to let a day go by without thinking about your work so that you're consistent i'm kind of like a turtle i don't work that quickly but i'm very methodical and plodding <laughs> the uh, a lot of what you do and perhaps this is a this is framing a number of questions that were said and, and some personal curiosities uh, a lot of the great teachers that i've interacted with a lot of the great academics have a a personal stake in what it is they're doing uh, and the way that they that the old phrase of uh, teachers teach how they were taught uh, whilst perhaps not backed up in a scholarly sense i found seems to ring fairly true at least in those who i've spoken to and your interest in lifelong learning your interest in the in the informal capacities seems to come a great deal from the way that you have acquired your musical skill uh, do you think that the way that you've acquired your musical skills how do you think that informs the way that you approach scholarship do you approach it in a similarly informal manner or are you very by the book how you were told uh quite prescriptive um that is a great question because i know that my informal approach informs everything that I do, probably the way I live my life, because that's positionality. And so I would have to say that, yes, I've tackled some topics and approach my scholarly work in probably largely informal ways. I'm, I'm fairly inventive. I understand the rigors of research. I have that training and I know the parts of research and what need to be included. As, and of course, you have to have a methodology because that's expected for publication. So let's just say that I'm, I'm very informal, but the rigors of the profession necessitate that I use certain formal modes in my scholarship. Because the idea is, of course, in, in academia is to publish 
and to share the results of the, that research. So, so books for I, I check my work. So I, I think that that's what keeps me legitimized, if, it, if that's a good word. Legitimized. Well, that's a, a, a constant, not to say concern, but it's a requirement for an academic career, isn't it? Is uh, box ticking, as I've, um, oh, is, is the phrase we use in Australia. I wonder if the same thing translates to the other people here. But ticking boxes is so important. And uh, on, on the note of ticking boxes and, and having the right experience to be able to do so. Uh, one of the other questions from the chat was from He Jiang, who said that uh, some people think it's a waste to get a PhD to, you know, when becoming a primary or secondary school teacher, which I think the equivalent might be elementary and middle school um, in the American system. Uh, whilst and, and continues, while others think that researchers lack the practical experience of being involved in teaching. Now, this obviously isn't a an issue you have because you have the very practical experience of being involved in teaching and beyond that you have the practical experience of having gigged in teaching you're not just someone who went was taught how to teach music and then taught music you you know music from a number of angles how do you feel about the issue of that legitimacy in the perspective of a teacher uh, trying to, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll, I'll rephrase that, pardon me, of a researcher having been a teacher and on top of that having been an, uh, a performer, do you think that all of those perspectives are mandatory? Do you, What do you feel about having a, a unique positionality and perhaps lacking some of those areas? Absolutely. There are no requirements for becoming a researcher. Many of the people that end up becoming academics have gravitate towards a more intellectual approach to music and music education. And so I think I saw someone talking about their interest in music history. So it doesn't have to be performance and it doesn't have to be um, teaching children, although that will inform your employability in certain contexts. So, you know, but there's no, there's no magic box that anyone has to check. And that is the beauty of the positionality thing is that we are all contributors and we're all working toward the betterment of music education, regardless of where we come from and who we are, but we can all contribute our own unique perspectives. And that, I, that was really what I was hoping to have my big message. Whoever you are, you have a unique perspective and can make a unique contribution to the scholarship and to music educators. And for me, getting that doctorate was partly to please my father, who was really cheering for me, and I wanted to do it before he passed. But it was also not, I thought I would teach teachers when I retired from public education. But it wasn't really, getting the job in academia was a surprise. Because I was in an online program, I had no idea how my work compared with others. and. So it was a delightful surprise, but I wasn't doing it to impress anyone or just, you know, or to feel important, but I need, I'm a lifelong learner. So I'm still learning. And I think that's just part of who I am. For everyone, it's different. Of course. And it is music being a, a, an infinite art form informed by every experience you've ever had of course you, you need to approach it from your own perspective and have a conviction to that perspective uh for the next question i might draw one of the if i may and, and uh, christian vasilev let me know if you're not comfortable doing so uh, but i'd like some some of your own i suppose expansion on your question christian asked a question about 
uh, philosophical reflection and its place in music education research. Uh, but philosophy is not my forte, and I'm not going to pretend that I can expand on it. So, Christian, if you are in the chat still, uh, you don't have to turn on your mic, uh, your video if you're not comfortable doing so, but it'd be wonderful for you to phrase your own question in your own words if you're comfortable doing so. Yes, of course. Uh, can you all hear me? We yes. can. Yes, okay. I can't use my video right now, but yeah, well, this is, I think I've, I've tried to, to phrase the question as accurately as possible. I come from a philosophical background, uh, although I have a PhD now in musicology, but it was on the topic of philosophy of music. And I'm very interested in music educational uh, research, of course, in the philosophy of music education, obviously. But I tend to think at least where I come from, I come from Bulgaria, from Sofia, Bulgaria, in Eastern Europe. And here, in general, uh, people who do music education, teachers basically, are very... in people's lives uh, they tend to approach this question as if this is something self-explanatory and does not need additional reflection so what's your uh, thoughts on this I, I just wanted to ask thank you very much Christian that is that is a great question but yes there are philosophers in music education and they continue to write about these issues today. I can think of Marissa Silverman, who is someone that I gravitate toward because she is one that writes about a pedagogy of love, which is a philosophical construct as well as a pedagogical construct. So you, there are people out there and of course there is philosophy of music education there are publications dedicated directly to that topic I, that is not my area of expertise i but i do think that philosophy educational philosophy in particular is important and we do teach that in in our classes at the master's level at bu but it's very directly related to teaching and learning. And if you're interested in philosophy, then you should seek out some publications in philosophy of music. Jody, do you remember the, the titles of those publications? They're, it's not coming to my brain right now. Yeah, my PhD advisor, Bennett Reamer, um, a philosophy of music education. Um, certainly David Elliott's uh, Music Matters, um, certainly Estelle Jorgensen's uh, work, and I'm first time blanking on that, um, that, that title of that, Will, maybe you have it uh, or somebody else has it. Um, certainly Wayne Bowman's uh, stuff, uh, Susan, Susan, thank you. <laughs> um, um, and, and certainly Marissa Silverman, uh, um, uh, um, Randall um, Alsup, um his work um um i'm i'm th yeah the list goes on it just depends the specialty area right i mean there's philosophy and then there's sub philosophies of of uh trauma and care and aesthetic education and praxialist i mean you name the philosophy philosophical area and you can find it um, the philosophy uh, for research and music, philosophical research and music education is a journal um, that you might want to seek um, so that um, you get an array of philosophical perspectives. Thanks. Thank you, Jody. Thank you and I for the, yeah, thank you all for the, yeah, yeah. For the answer. I think I might pick the last couple of questions just to make sure we don't run violently over time. Um, Stefan Ingeslav had an interesting question that I suspect is is bigger than this forum can allow. Uh, but Stefan asked about that asked you to talk about the purposes for music education in primary school. Uh, is music 
But this is an eternal question, isn't it? Is it music for the purpose of itself or is it for well-being, uh, for mental development and, and the development of social and emotional skills? And it seems that uh, Stefan is asking specifically for first to fourth grade, which is early elementary school, I believe, in the American system, isn't it? Yes. The answer is yes. Music is all of those things, I think. I mean, because it's part of child development. And I think if we're going to educate the whole child, then we need to include music, which is a human activity, just as we include all the other subjects, which are human activities. So yes, music is social emotional. It teaches children to cooperate with each other. Yes, it is um, something that we do because music is important in society. Yes, it is important for brain development. So, um, and, and it will depend on who you read or speak to about which is more important. I tend to not want to get into those issues because it doesn't matter. Me, it, the child should experience music often because uh, society has changed. It is their only avenue for active music making at the age because people don't have pianos in their homes anymore. Very many um, parents don't play their instruments after high school or participate in music outside of the home. And so children get that active kinesthetic uh, experience in, in those early grades and they get to discover how to use their voices. And it's, it's more holistic. I couldn't narrow it down to one important thing. And it's definitely experience that I suspect a lot of us had in some capacity growing up. Relationship with music is going to change, uh, rather children's relationship with music has changed compared to how we are. And and that that is a wonderful segue into, we'll call it our second last question from uh, our own Will Kish, who has a, a, a wonderfully concise question. That, again, perhaps this forum is the best thing to explore it fully. But Will asks, do you think matching positionality and position is difficult in some contexts, practically speaking? I'm not sure what the difference is. Will, can you? Will, do you want uh, speaking up? <laughs> Where's Will hiding? Yeah, sorry. What I meant by the question, um, I'm a, a PhD student, but at the same time, I'm a full-time uh, K through 12 public school teacher in the United States. And just knowing about the practical um, concerns, the things we have to do in that kind of teaching context um if there's a misalignment between positionality as you've developed as a human being and your actual position and maybe community expectations administration expectations those things could create problems that was the gist of the question oh the cognitive dissonance you got it I, yes okay uh, a lot of young people have that going into schools, Will, especially in today's world, because either they're very conservatory oriented and they're going into public schools and obviously it's not a conservatory. And then from the other end, some of us who are popular musicians and we are expected to go to band competitions and we don't believe in competition and we believe in music as, as a human thing. That I don't have an answer for the cognitive dissonance. And, and position is different in Mississippi than it is in Ohio, than it is in, in Massachusetts. So again, your, where you teach is critical 
and the expectations are different. I teach this a, a curriculum class. That's how I met Shri. And so everyone designs their own curriculum project based on ethnography, demography, philosophy, um, learning theories that you gravitate towards. We teach critical pedagogy, but that's not appropriate in every context so that someone who teaches in Korea has different expectations in their position. We can't as as a as an educator, I can't change that. The only way I can address that and I did in my own school was to introduce new ways of doing things and then see how the community reacted favorably or not favorably when i left the middle school one third of the students in the school were in the choir because they could bring their ukuleles they could play a a, a cajon in their their friendship group and make music that they wanted to do they had autonomy and they valued that in the classroom so I understand what you're saying, but there many are, people are afraid to take risks and make change. And without knowing the context, it's hard to give blanket advice. If I were in Texas, I would be a very unhappy teacher because of the demands on educators in that area. So. I, but my positionality means I am not moving from Massachusetts because this is an area where I feel comfortable and my teaching and ph philosophical needs are aligned with my context. Does that make sense? Absolutely. Yeah. This is why I asked the question, just because a lot of people are able to look for the job that they want some people aren't necessarily in that situation and they need to hear that you know there's validation here as well and will we have school systems that are highly competitive in massachusetts and we have those school systems that are haves and have nots just like everywhere and as the state association is looking at those those differences and equity, diversity, and inclusion are so important. Wonderful. Well, what I may do, I may ask one more. I've noticed the time, of course, where we're approaching 30 minutes, well, 30 minutes past the hour, as I say, uh, perhaps not totally relevant to all of us, but we're approaching 90 minutes. I think I, I was umming and ahhing. I think I will do one more question that was from uh, uh, Barry, as I've ident identified themselves as Barry. I'll just put that in the chat because uh, I'm which they do not read Mandarin. And they asked again, Uh, but Ruth, feel free to interpret that and answer that how you see fit. Again, it goes back to experiential learning and, and, and a curriculum can vary um, depending, again, on who you are teaching the expectations of the community, etc. But I think the most valuable thing that one can do is give students skills that they can use in their life. For example, learning how to compose. We start that young with piggyback songs where they add their own lyrics and arranging how, here's, here's a tune, make up your own B section, make up an introduction. Here's a guitar. This is how you read chord symbols. And that's something they can take home and do. They can look things up on the internet or ta learn tab so they can play their music at home and with their friends. It's not how you teach so much, what you teach so much as how you teach it and how you make those, the skills that you teach transferable to what the students might do with their friendships, groups, 
outside of school. And that's when I just did some work with older musicians. Most of them learned a few things and then they would hang out with their groups of friends and play jazz or play in a band. And that was how they kept music going throughout their lives. There's no magic formula because a lot of this is very culturally based. In without a band. But if you know somebody that plays guitar and bass, you might be able to come up with a pretty cool little eclectic ensemble. So we need to show students how that's done. And then it's up to them. Mm, I think there's a great deal of research in uh, jazz in business, jazz approaches in business, isn't there? Uh, and I think improvisation yes. is, well, it's really what we do all day, isn't it? So there's a lot of uh, uh, a, a great deal of ways to reinterpret the things that we learn in music that don't have to just be the way that we interact in a band, isn't there? I, I think that the interaction is fundamental and, and being able to, to give and take in relationships is really part of the, the most valuable part, part of being a musician, you know? And in the classroom, it's the same thing, the give and take. Wonderful. Well, uh, as much as all of us, I'm sure, would love to continue hearing from you for hours and hours and hours, uh, I would like to, to close out this, uh, this session. Uh, and uh, I'll say very sadly, close out this session because it has truly been wonderful to hear from you dr Debro, uh, and i hope we can have you again sometime to continue talking about these things uh, but we'll formally close this session i'd like to remind uh, to prompt anyone if you have any questions for ruth you can email them through to the student chapter at ismay.org email address or even ruth if you're comfortable perhaps people can email you directly um, but if you'd fun. like you can no worries. So you can forward them uh, if uh, somebody, uh, or perhaps Shri or Ruth yourselves, pop your own emails. Uh, a survey. We've done. Uh, in order to not only know how you felt about this, but how can we continue to do this for you guys in the future? The student chapter is for you. It's not for us. We don't uh, we do not do this so we can listen to Ruth. That's a lie, actually. I do like listening to Ruth, but we do this so everyone can listen. And I encourage all of you to invite every one of your colleagues and your friends and your cohorts um, to future sessions. Um, so that'll, that should automatically prompt at the end of this session here. Um, I'll thank as well all of our uh, the student chapter leadership team. We've got obviously Jody, who's our main academic convener, um, and who's uh, whoever still we've got, uh, Will obviously, uh, Susanna from Poland, and oh pardon me, Hungary, I should say, uh, and then Shri's hanging out in India, and oh pardon me, who's still here, Lashwan's in China. So look, thank you to all of the the student chapter leadership team. Uh, that have uh, helped put this together. As I said, Ruth, we'd love to have you again in the future. Uh, Ruth, will you be going to the the conference in Helsinki next year? I'm hoping to get permissions to go. <laughs> I hope so. Well, I'm uh, rain, hail or shine. And look, knowing uh, Finland, we might get all three. Uh, but we'll I'll be there and it'd be lovely to meet everyone that's that's still hanging out here, 25 participants. Thank everyone for your time. Uh, it's uh, one thirty a.m. here, so I'm going straight to bed. Uh, I imagine a couple of you in the states, you're probably going straight to work. But regardless, thanks everyone for coming. It's been absolutely beautiful, uh, and I hope uh, I hope to see you in October. We'll have another session uh, that's going to be with Ismay, uh, uh, a number of commission chairs that are going to discuss the uh, the ins and outs of submitting to a commission. Uh, 
interacting with a with a commissioner, the the tiny little subsets of Ismé that they are. And I think it's going to be beautiful, a really interesting session. Jody, you got something Just to say? Just a reminder that Ismé Helsinki uh, proposals are due October 1st. So that is going to be before we talk with the commissioners about how to present um, um, uh, proposals for the individual session. So just a reminder, October 1st, Ismé Helsinki due. Sure. Yeah. No? That's yeah, uh, October 2nd, that's fine. But November 1st is the free conferences. Right. That's correct. So Ismay's That's why we're Ismay's having the session in October. Yes. That's correct. So Ismay Helsinki well. sessions, they're due at the November. start of October, but the commission submissions, they are due at the very first, is it first of November, I believe, isn't it? Very first day. So we'll have that session in October oh. if you want to submit to any of the commissions. Uh, but get your stuff in for Helsinki. Everyone, look, submit anything and everything. Uh, the there are what is it 18 19 different uh review boards I, I i don't i i got so confused when i was reading all of those i'm just not clever enough just not there yet give me another 20 years thank you everyone for your time i'm going to bed all of you got to work or wherever you need to go it's been wonderful and ruth thank you so much for coming bye